if you hear any banging, I'm going to try to get rid of it, but it's my contractor and my mom. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's my contractor <laughs> with a hammer. So hopefully I can avoid it. Get it banging and then anyway. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to SVU Pod, especially heinous. I'm Gabe. I'm Tasha. <laughs> I loved this episode. It was so good. Oh, we are on season three, episode fifteen, execution. I'm not even saying that because we're like, let's try to be more positive about the stuff that we hate. No, I know. And the I last was... few episodes were like, oh, this is so great, you guys. Yeah, fireworks. I know, fireworks. I, w- I was worried that they were gonna think think that we were like fakie overdoing it. Yeah, but like the last few episodes have been fucking rad, super good, and then Amazing. the the episodes before that were like terrible. There was like three terrible ones and now there's been like three awesome you ones. You know, and it's the content of it. It's well-written shit. I mean, nothing's ever going to be a fucking handful of diamonds and a flog handle ever again. I can't imagine. <laughs> but yeah, like the kid shit, it's just like one awful fucking thing. I mean, this was fucked up. Just the acting was super good and the guest stars were super good. And the way it was like, The you know, timeline. Yeah, that memento it. shit. It was like Pulp Fiction-y. Mm. Like in the yeah. way it bounced around, you know. Like or like um, any movie that begins with the end. So there I was. Da, da, right. da. This is, you know what? This isn't like Memento. This is like The Emperor's New Groove. Shit, I don't remember the timeline of that. In the beginning, he, it's just a llama sitting in the rain in the jungle. Oh yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, how did I get here? Oh. And then it cuts back to the beginning. That's exactly what this is like. All right. <laughs> All right. So there's a dude with his head down on a table and he's telling Huang that all of his theories are flawed. They're in like some kind of cell thing or whatever. You have no idea what's going on. And it's this obviously prisoner because Mm -hmm. he's got a jumpsuit on. He's got a shaved head and he's the way he's speaking is like over it. Yeah. He's like, what time is it? Blah, blah, blah. All your theories are flawed. And then Huang says, how? And this guy says, I never degraded anyone. And then on the screen, the words two hours before execution pop up. And I was like, oh, this guy's on death row. This is like doing one of those backwards. Yeah, like we just mm. talked about. Huang wants this dude to tell him about his first time. And then he says, I want to know how you remember your first time. And Huang says, fondly. And this dude says, I'm not asking you. Stabler is sitting at the other end of the table, quietly taking notes and keeping to himself while Huang mm. straight reads this guy. Stabler looks up and he says, fondly. This guy's like, I don't have fucking time for games. It's two hours before execution. Didn't you see it on a screen? <laughs> and then Stabler's like, all right, well, it was painful for her. I thought I'd done something wrong. And this guy's like, you did. You fucking knocked her up. You seem like you'd have a bunch of bastards running around. You're just a running dog in the streets, a slave to your impulses. This, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. He is calling every ass. I mean, Maureen was a teenage accident. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And an adult accident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We hate Marine. Yeah. <laughs> and Sailor's like, oh, your point being, you're just like me. And he's like, you're exactly like me. My first time was painful, but it was perfect. The thing was exquisite. Thing being the victim, I'm guessing? Yeah, just so we're all clear, Huang and Stabes are recounting their first consensual sexual experience, and this dude sounds like he's recounting his first sexual assault slash rape slash murder, we come to find out. Yeah, and Stabler goes, oh, what was her name? And he's like, "Eh, nice try. And then he's like, it's my party, guys. You can leave whenever. Because they just want answers. He's just playing around. And then Wong's like, oh, well, if we did, you wouldn't have any control, and that wouldn't be any fun for you, would it? This guy starts, like, manipulating maniacally laughing he's so good Mm -hmm. and also i hate that i think he's kind of hot and it sucks oh my god (gasps) gabe okay i didn't do okay i was gonna stop us here anyway because i want to talk about who he is as an actor but it's not until later when they're interviewing him again that i was like i am not about to tell everyone when we record that i am so attracted to this (laughs) yeah me too okay because he's a sick sick sicky fuck yeah but i'm watching this interview later and i'm going (laughs) yeah the the later interview was really where i was like Yep. Oh, fuck. Yep. Getting it. <laughs> Getting it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ugh. Anyway, so this guy, he's been in a million things. His name is Nick Chinland. I'm just going to go down a list of his credits. Law and Order regular for like three years. The Sopranos, Training Day, fucking Con Air. <gasps> 
The X Files for five years, Lethal Weapon three, Desperate Housewives. There's so many. Whoa, so many. He was a fucking get. He was the get for this episode because he had just been in Training Day and Con Air, huge movies. Oh my god, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and he's been in like a million procedurals. Like anybody who's anybody in this episode has been in every procedural show, CSIs and all that kind of shit. mm -hmm. Was he in Oz at all? I did not see that. Huang says, "You're a liar, Matt." Your first time wasn't perfect. In fact, it was so disappointing. You try not to remember it. You were so shitty at it. You didn't even climax. Wong didn't say shitty, but this, you know. he didn't. But he did say mm. it with like a really because Huang is so level mm. all the time, and he rarely changes inflection. But when he does, it's for a reason. Mm. And he was just trash talking him with that tone, which is like, ugh. yeah, he's like, nice try. You suck. You can't fuck. And your dick don't work. <laughs> yeah. And this dude is like getting pissed and starts clenching his fists. This guy, his name is Matt. Okay. So Matt says, one thing was young and ripe, begging, but I took my time with it. It had beautiful brown eyes, almost sleepy. Then I went to work and they went big and round. First it pleaded, then it bargained. The whole time he's talking, he's staring at Stabler. Wong says this interview's over because he's like fucking analyzing. And he sees the way it's escalating. Yeah. Yeah. At this time, after the guy had clenched his fist and he's saying all this fucked up shit, he's puts his hands under the table mm-hmm. and Huang's like, mm, I don't like this. And he goes over to the alarm button and he starts like bzz, 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 buzzing, which yeah, yeah. Th- there should be help there immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So Wong wants the interview over, but death row Matt keeps going. The thing screamed in pain and yelled in fear. It was alive through every moment of it. Even when I gutted it and the blood sprayed over me like a warm shower, I can almost taste it. Oh so Wong's God. just like fucking. He was on that buzzer. Like he was in an elevator with diarrhea like (laughs) (laughs) but death row matt says relax chief the guards are changing shifts and i'm like oh my god wong screams Mm. elliot get up from the table and death row matt flips over at sailor and he's like (laughs) he falls over death row matt runs over to wong starts bashing the back of his head into the wall and choking him stabler jumps on his back and wong slides down the wall unconscious with like a blood smear okay i'm sorry But this scene, although intense, was hilarious to me. It was. Was this this the first take? Did they just use the first take? We're like, we only have time to go through this once. Do like a high school musical level of acting here. And they're all like, okay, got it. So yeah, when Stabler jumped away from the table, he literally said, whoa, (laughs) as he (laughs) hopped up and jumped away from the table. And then he like fell to the ground. It was like, yeah, it was weird. (laughs) Huang, <laughs> death row Matt had Huang around the neck to like hit his head against the wall, but he was, there was no tension in his hands and Huang's head was gently tapping against the wall. A cup, And the wall was moving. And Huang's <laughs> so. tongue was out a little. He was like, he's like, ah! <laughs> and then he yeah. slumped to the ground unconscious. I laughed so hard. Mm. It was pretty great. So Stabler and Death Row Matt are rolling around on the ground fighting. This dude is much bigger than Stabler. Then you hear a buzzer just as Matt is on top of Stabler punching him in the face. Then it cuts to the theme song. (gasps) This is like the most intense opening scene. Theme song. Now we're in the precinct. It's three days before the execution. This adorable. Oh, my God fucking debbie's parents i know like her dad is nathan lane slash oliver platt mixed together yes (laughs) thanks (laughs) oh my god i have oh my lips (laughs) (laughs) his name is alan cooper and his wife's name is hannah and they are the parents of debbie cooper a murder victim of stabler's and his old partners from 10 years ago this is where i gasp because the opening credits are happening over this scene ty burrell Mm -hmm. is in this episode (gasps) oh Who's that? Claire, do yourself a favor and join me in a wedge salad. He's the dad for Modern Family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Debbie was on her way home from school when she was abducted. Her murderer was never found. So Stabler remembers his old partner, Dave Rossetti, was the lead on the case. Alan and Hannah came to Stabler because they think they know who killed Debbie. They say it's Matthew Brodus. This is the dude from the interrogation room in the beginning. (gasps) Okay. Yeah. Death Row Matt. Stabler takes them to a conference room. They talked about how much they hurt when Debbie was killed and, you know, all the therapy and victims groups they went to and they stuck together and almost tore them apart, but they stuck together. They felt like they were finally at a place where they could deal with not knowing who Debbie's killer was until they heard Matt Barotis's press conference. This death row Matt guy said that he wants to sell tickets to his execution to raise money for his daughter's education, but he doesn't have any kids that they know of. The Coopers explained that the school Barotis mentioned was Our Lady of Light. 
And that was where Debbie used to go. Yeah, I feel like this would get disregarded IRL, but Staves is going to relate to this dad and yeah. push everything out of the way. This takes priority right now, which is yep. b- 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 what he does. Yeah. <laughs> so cut to Cragen's office. Stabler tells Cragen and Huang that Debbie's murder happened before Vicap, so Brodus' signature wasn't recorded yet. There's a lot of open homicides that aren't in the system yet, if ever. Debbie's murder happened in New Jersey, and Cragen doesn't think that they'll let them near him. New Jersey's not going to let us near this hump anyway, he says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And even if they do, Craigan doesn't think that Brodus mm. will talk. Mm-hmm. Huang thinks that Brodus will talk. So Huang says that serial killers usually kill their victims right away, then take their time with the bodies. But Brodus is different. He kept the victims alive when he tortured them. He needs an audience. Poor Debbie was hogtied with plumber's tape and tortured, and Brodus was a plumber's apprentice at the time. The difference is Debbie was blinded pre-mortem, and he hadn't done that to any other victims. But they think that it was because Debbie knew him and then stayed Stabler's like, my old partner thought that too, but we couldn't connect him. Right. It's like a serial killer symbolism thing. Right. I yeah. loved how when this was all in the beginning, I loved how Huang was kind of nestled back into a darker corner. Mm-hmm. What are you doing back there? He's always in a little corner, like looking at everything and like crushing up meds to sneak into Stabler's <laughs> food to help him with his rage. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. Like, what else is he doing? That's why they go to lunch like five times in this episode. <laughs> no shit. Well, I'm just like, like, I got it. I got it. It's like, <laughs> his drink. So was like i'm so relaxed and happy and tired (laughs) good that's a new feeling for you isn't it that's so good do you want to talk about it sailor just wants to get in front of brodus to get him to talk Mm -hmm. but brodus is being put to death in three days and that might not be an option being able to talk to him that is okay huang says that quote Brodus is a multi-victim signature killer that's very rare, and it's even more rare to find someone who's done it more than once. Wong thinks that he could maybe get a field interview, so he's going to get the brass to talk to Jersey and put pressure on them to let Huang and Stabler talk to Brodus. Yeah. Huang leaves and Craig stops Stabler before he takes off, and he says he knows he really wants to help the Coopers, and Stabler's like, this has nothing to do with that. And, and you, you know, know it. it. Yeah, Yeah, I was like, chill. His old partner, Rossetti, shot himself in the jaw over this case. The level of intensity in this episode is hot. How many minutes are we into this fucking five? Five minutes in? Right. The the credits are still fucking going over shit. Craig can give Stabler three days to figure this out you know, the amount of time that the execution is. Mm -hmm. Munch is going to take Debbie's evidence to the lab. Maybe there's DNA from 10 years ago. All right. Munch is in the lab dropping off Debbie's evidence. He's like, don't trust the cop with a gift or (laughs) or whatever. And I didn't care, but hot lab dude ain't having it. He's super busy. But Munch is like, we need this done before this Brodus guy gets executed in three days. He's got plumber's tape, fibers, and two different blood types. A hot lab dude is going to give it his best go. And then Munch is like, you're the man. This scene is basically... Hey, can you? Oh my God, no! Come on. Okay, <laughs> we. Then they high five. Yes. Like that's all they needed to do. Yeah, that is all they did. That's all it was. Yeah. Munch and Staves are at Our Lady of Light School. <laughs> and we're like seeing kids crossing the street, and then you just hear, "Bad, don't be late." <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and the pans up to this guy. The dude they're talking to is. I think he's the head of school. It's a private school. This guy is talking about different staff coming in and out. So yeah. basically the principal. He says that he didn't know Debbie. She was a student before he started there. And his predecessor died in the mid-90s. Stabler's got his old partner Rosetti's notes. And they say that Debbie was close to a few teachers. Vivian Parrish, Michael McKinney, and Andrea Mason. The only one left around is Andrea Mason. But she's out sick today. This dude's going to get them her number. Stabler asks about plumbing stuff. Like, oh, have you guys had any plumbing? Plumbing work done, whatever. Obviously trying to tie Brodus to the school somehow Mm -hmm. because he's smart. The head says they had some plumbing issues a long time ago. He's also going to get the number of the plumbing place in Brooklyn that they used. So he is helpful. At the plumbing place, this old dude has a ledger open and says he has three men working the job at the school. Susie Orman is at a desk in the background working on her books. I didn't realize she was going to speak later, but I was like, who is this bitch in the flashy jacket and the big old hair? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Two of these guys that were in his ledger are still working for the plumbing biz. Stabler asked him if he had anyone by the names of Linwood Bradley, Matthew Braden, or Lonnie Matthews on the payroll. This guy's super confused, and Susie Orman pops up from her desk and goes, It's that serial killer! Those are his aliases! Mm-hmm. Because she fucking watches Dateline. Yeah, she's like a total true Right, the guy's buff. like, I don't get it. And she's like, what don't you get? He hands them the ledger and tells them to look for themselves. 
themselves. He's offended that they could think that he would have employed Brodus. Yeah. We're like, dude, this isn't your fault. Just give us the information. Chill. There's so much fucking testosteronal ego throughout this entire episode, starting with this guy. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, it's, it's starting with Stabler, but yeah. Okay, so yeah, Stabler drives me nuts this entire episode. Outside the building, Stabler thinks this old guy was pretty defensive for not having anything to do with the murder. But Munch thinks he probably just didn't want to be linked to Brodus. Munch is going to check him out anyway. I mean, it would be bad for a bit business if it was like oh this fucking serial killer worked at fucking jk plumbings and such you know and yeah <laughs> fucking jk in there is like i fucking told you guys i didn't want anything to do with this they still haven't gotten a hold of that teacher andrea mason and then stabler's phone rings is it her no it's wong <laughs> Uh, he wants to meet Stabes for lunch at the FBI field office. Wong is so cool. He like got off the phone. And he's like, oh, he wants to meet me for lunch. <laughs> then he gets there. And he's like, it's a fucking hot dog. We got to do interviews. <laughs> He's like, I don't have time for this shit. <laughs> Stabler's like, this is where I trick dates to coming to. <laughs> Stabler meets Wong at a hot dog cart. Stabler's like, more relish. <laughs> and like fills his pockets, just like fistfuls of relish <laughs> gooping into his pea coat. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right wong's wong's like we don't have time to fuck around we're doing indirect personality assessments with brodus's ex cellmates today you can tell wong is pumped uh-huh so robert rule is doing life for rape and manslaughter and leroy russell is on death row while leroy russell was in the clinker he converted to islam and has since become a model citizen but refuses to talk to them Wong says that these guys are supposed to give them some background on Brodus. What he likes, what he dislikes. Yep. How they can relate to him because Brodus won't just open up to Stabler. Mm -hmm. Stabler's like, I know how to interrogate a prisoner. <laughs> and Wong looks at him and he's like, I know you do, but you haven't encountered this level of depravity before. And Stabler's like, uh, I've, uh, I've done serial killers before. <laughs> I, I felt a little defensive at first about mm -hmm. like Stabler you don't need to puff up your chest the second anything happens but i was like yeah. maybe he's just hangry because he they didn't get their hot dogs and like walking and talking and eating hot dogs like they normally do uh -huh. Huang yeah. got them like somebody with any kind of etiquette had them yeah. in a bag and they were walking to a place to go sit down yeah. and stabler's like there's so I much i know how to do stuff oh he was i yeah. wonder how many hot dogs like how many hot dogs do you have to order before you get a bag for your hot dogs I think there was just two, but there was probably like, um, I don't know, salt and pepper packets, some napkins, a you know, gallon Ziploc bag full of relish. <laughs> Huang just keeps gently reminding Stabler that he actually hasn't dealt with a serial killer like the rarity that is Brodus. Huang is really trying to hammer home that this is a game to these killers. So Huang really just needs Stabler to listen to him and follow his fucking lead. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Cut to Sing Sing. Robert Rule is person Shrek, a total creep, and pissed he's missing Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> yes. Also, he looks so fucking familiar. Who I know, and he, I looked know? him up, and there, uh, there's not a ton of stuff. He's not... Hmm. I know. He looks super familiar to me, too. He might just look like somebody. I think so. Or sound, his voice sounded like somebody. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's John C. Riley in a Shrek costume playing <laughs> this guy. <laughs> also, he has arm hair that goes all the way up his arm at the same amount of thickness and robin williams yeah he has got robin williams arms yeah rest um in peace. Rest in peace. so this robert rule he wants a deal but stabler's like dude life in prison isn't actually life it could be like 12 to 15 years so like shut up work with us here rules like i'm not going anywhere my crimes are fucked yeah life is life huang thinks he should be grateful to get a good mark on his record because that does make a difference for allowances in prison and stuff right Stabler says, the deal depends on what you know. Then we'll talk terms. Huang's like, mm. wait a minute. No, I think we're done here. Either answer the questions or not. The FBI doesn't make deals. Mm. And Stabler looks at Huang like, <laughs> and then at this point, I'm like, hey, where's Benson? I haven't seen her at all. Like the past two episodes or three episodes, mm -hmm. they've been like switching up partners and stuff. I think they're shaking it up to really paint with the full rainbow of dynamics between everybody. Right. Because now it's like Staves and Huang together this whole time. Munch pops in and out, really crushing it at his job. Sorry, no. He's mm -hmm. doing great. So they didn't get anything out of this guy. Outside of the cell, Stabler is hissed at Huang. Huang's like, procedure. 
I suggest you get familiar with it before we do any more interviews. I love Sassy Wong, by the he way. He is sassy, sassy this episode. Mm-hmm. For awesome. good reason. Oh, yeah. This is his fucking job. He's in the FB fucking eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bruh. It's like Stabler respects him a lot until his fucking tender ego is even poked. I then know. it's like he can't work with him. I don't want to follow the rules. You didn't know that about me. <laughs> Every, everybody's <laughs> like, hey, hey, do this to his <laughs> ego. And he's like, ah! I have children. I have 600 children. Do you know how much relish that takes to feed a family of seven? Oh, or my whatever. God. I don't know. Anybody saying anything offensive or s- the slightest offense to Stabler's ego is the happening. This is his happening. Yeah. Happening. <laughs> yeah. What happened to the bees? <laughs> you can't blame me for wanting to play a scientist. Huang says that they were wasting their time with Rule anyway because Rule is beneath Brodus in Brodus's mind. He wouldn't have told him anything important, regardless of how long they were cellmates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he goes, <laughs> Stabler's like, how can you be sure? How do you know if you don't talk to the scrote? <laughs> yeah. He did. I, I didn't catch that until the second time and I was like, did he say scrote? I'm not pausing it. I'm just going to keep going. I wasn't watching it with subtitles at first and I went, and I choked on my cereal and I went back and I watched it again. I'm like, I got to get closed caption on. And then I had to take it off of my phone and start watching it on my computer so that I could take a photo of him saying <laughs> scrote and it being in text on the screen. It was in <laughs> subtitles. I'm going to start calling people scrotes. I loved it. <laughs> so Huang is over mm-hmm. this with Stabler. He goes, I've been doing this for a long time. Come on. Yeah. Fucking Stabler loses his shit and gets in Wong's fucking face and says, so have I. You don't get up from the table until you've seen everyone's hand. And Huang's like, the FBI is running these interviews and I'm not offering any deals. I hope that's clear. Then he hops on his rocket ship dick and blasts the fuck (laughs) off. It's very acme of him. Huang's the wily coyote of dick havers (laughs) on SVU. Now Stabler's in Cabot's office. Cabot hangs up the phone of justice and it was New Jersey. They won't play ball. She wants him to file an official request. But by the time they get an answer, Brodus will be executed because the clock is ticking. How much time do they have, Gabe? Like three, two or three days? uh, It's three days, uh, but Mm -hmm. maybe a little less now. But yeah, it has to go through all these channels and they don't there won't be any time for that. TikTok. Mm -hmm. She says that New Jersey has an inferiority complex about New York and are digging in their heels on principle. And you can't tell another state how to do their business. Stabler, Mm -hmm. who's dramatically looking out the window, he's got the dark blinds across his face and he asks Cabot, how many times have you lost a case? And how many times have you gotten a second chance? And Cabot's like, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. He wants her to file a temporary stay and... She doesn't feel comfortable with that, but he just wants a little more time with him, not to commute his sentence. She says that if he can find any direct evidence linking Brodus to Debbie, she can help. In the meantime, she's going to head to New Jersey and ask a friend for a favor. An old friend for a big favor. She is not going to have a career after SVU, man. They've like milked her dry. She like Mm -hmm. has no favors left. I don't like that you said milked. I know. But if you if you, you can milk a cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what she's getting paid. It's not enough. Like that's what this comes down to. Yeah. She's literally just there to just make all these fucking dudes feel better. How did they ever solve a case before Cabot and her <laughs> they never did. deep deep pocket of IOUs? Now Cabot is in the office of the executive ADA of New Jersey. Okay? Mm-hmm. So it's that dude from the remake of Dawn of the Dead. That's like the first time I ever saw this guy. Mm-hmm. He was the guy that owned the boat and he was a piece of shit. He's also the dad in the show um, Modern Modern Family. Yes, this okay. is Ty Burrell. Mm-hmm. All right, so this dude, like, he doesn't want to grant Cap at the interview. She literally was like, why? It's just an interview. <laughs> <laughs> You granted it to other agencies. Why not mine? He says that the other cops talked to Brodus when he had appeals on the table yet. He doesn't want anything to go wrong since it's so close to the execution. Cabot's like, we don't want to sabotage your execution. Which was a weird thing to say. I know. It, the, the whole t- the whole like talking about somebody dying and politicizing it and going back and forth was just so weird for me in this whole scene. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though he's a piece of shit, it's just still, it was just weird. Right. They just need an interview to get some answers. They just need truth. He still refuses. And she's like, are you really going to 
to make me do this the hard way? It sort of sounds like they used to be an item because he's like, what, you thought ancient history would get you a seat at the table? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, whoa. And then Cabot says, I came as one professional to another. He still refuses. And Cabot goes, what is it, Alan? A re-election year? New Yorkers can't vote here, so guess it doesn't matter. And he's like, you've grown a pair since the last time I saw you. And she fires back, well, you lost yours because victim rights used to be a priority. Ooh. Uh, 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 Dude, I bet you they had crazy sex. They had crazy <laughs> sex. <laughs> He's worried Brodus will con- like. He's you know worried- what? No, I'm gonna. I wasn't gonna say anything. She would break him physically of and course. emotionally. No of fucking course. way could he handle that. Yeah. Okay. He's worried that Brodus will confess to other murders in other states and get everyone in this like jurisdictional frenzy. And she's like, "Then you deal with it. If he murdered other victims and takes it to the grave, you become the facilitator." Mm-hmm. Alan is kind of mad. Alan is mad and says Brodus will do anything to stop his execution. They all do it. Bundy fucking did it. Who else did Mm -hmm. he say? Oh, Henry Lee Lucas. Did he say Henry Lee Mm -hmm. Lucas? Well, they did mention Lucas. He's like, these people will do anything to stop their execution. Of course. Right. You know, who wouldn't? But so he can't. Yeah. He's basically saying, like, what's the point of you doing this? This guy knows his execution date. If we stay it by any amount, this guy's going to dick around with that. He's going to take advantage. Yeah, and he's also like, well, whoever he killed will have justice in a couple days. Uh Well, the parents don't fucking know, and it's a whole thing. So he just will not allow access, period. And then they stare at each other for a minute because they're both super fucking serious. Oh, I thought you were going to say turned on. No, (laughs) that was you. Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh, okay, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So Munch and Stabler are back in the lab. Hot lab guy couldn't find enough blood to get DNA. There was a lot of it, but it was all Debbie's. Mm -hmm. The fibers are from uniform cloth, and the plumber's tape matched the VIN number on the New Jersey body, a.k.a. Debbie. That's their connection. Stabler says it's still too circumstantial to get Jersey let them talk to Brodus. Cabot parachutes in and says, that's exactly (laughs) right, you scrotes! In your mind, she's doing a lot of, like, (laughs) dropping out from the ceiling and sky stuff lately. (laughs) And I love it, I love it. So Hot Lab Guy says he can compare the tape to N- New Jersey's, but it's going to be hard to get it. Now we're on a walk and talk. Stabler's asking Munch a ton of questions, and he's all fucking worked up. Munch didn't find anything to link the plumbing company guy to Brodus. He re the Cooper neighborhood, and the interview with that teacher Andrea is tomorrow morning. Munch has everything ready to go and has Stabler completely covered. He is Anne Hathaway in The Devil Wears Prada, and Stabler mm-hmm. is... Meryl Streep. Yeah. Munch is like, I got you, dude. Everything's covered. Munch is like, I have a copy of the new Harry Potter for your daughters. I've got (laughs) everything taken care of. My boyfriend is a chef and he's leaving me. (laughs) Stabes is super stressed out, but come on. You know what I mean? Like he's really riding Munch. Like Munch fucking works for him, first of all. And I know you're going to hate this, but I know that you give him a little bit of credence. Munch is on top of his shit. He is. is. He's he's a dude you want in your corner. Like you Mm -hmm. want him to shut up most of the time, regardless of how annoying he is. It doesn't matter. But he was ahead of anything Stabler needed from him. Yeah. You got a canvas. He's like, I did. You owe me a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Usually it seems like Munch sucks. But when they ask him for stuff, he... Pretty much, he's like, I already did it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, good. Yeah, he's like, I don't have anyone who loves me, so (laughs) I've got nothing but time, fellas. Next, we see Stabler following Cabot into her office. He wants her to make a deal with an inmate who shared a cell with Brodus. Is he trying to go behind Huang's back? She goes, "Mm, no. (laughs) That's exactly how she said it, too. He's like, yeah. Could you arrange this? She's like, "Mm, no. Stabler really (laughs) needs this information, and he says he has no other options. She agrees with Huang that they should follow procedure, but Stabler's like, "Mm -mm, nope, that's not how I do things. Cabot asks, why are you pushing this so hard, buddy? And Stabler tells her he's seen all the crime scene photos and all the torture that this guy did to those 12 women before he killed them. He's like, I need all the ammo he can get to get Brodus to trip up because Brodus is fucking strong. Well, that seemed to move Cabot because in the next scene, Stabler's in the cell with Brodus's old cellmate rule. Okay? It's now two days before the execution. Ding, ding. Stabler tells him that as soon as the info he gives him is corroborated, they'll ship him off to Danbury Federal Prison. It's a 
easier prison to mm-hmm. live in. That's the best they can do. Yeah. Rule says that he raped that girl and that he belongs in prison, but not this one. Stabler just wants to know what this guy knows about Brodus. But this guy keeps talking about his little daughter that he's not allowed to talk to. He pulls out this little worn piece of paper with a crayon drawing on it. And I am mm. pulled out of the story now because no five-year-old can draw mm. hearts that symmetrical and stay in the lines. This was bullshit. Mm. I took four photos of it and I will post it. Mm-hmm. I have a near five-year-old and she's an artiste mm-hmm. and she draws like shit. So <laughs> so this guy is uh, pulling at Stabler's dad heartstrings. He wants Stabes to call his daughter for him. Stabler's like, absolutely <sighs> not. And he's like, all right, I won't talk unless you find out how my kid's doing. My ex won't let me have contact with her. If you had a kid, you would understand. And Stabler's like, <sighs> He makes his face like everyone must know first and foremost I'm a fucking dad. It takes his breath away that this guy yeah. could challenge his father dude. It looks like he he made his mouth into like a tiny little butthole and mm-hmm. like leaned in. I thought he was like winding up to like verbally fucking assault this guy. Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't. Instead, he says, I make that call and we talk about Brodus and the guy's like, yeah. Oh my God. I was like, no, are you kidding? Mm-hmm. He this calls. is exactly why Wong follows fucking procedures with these Ex- dudes. Yes, you know exactly. I, mean? yeah. I mean, you would think that Stabler ha- would have enough sense in dealing with guys that are trying to fucking manipulate the system. Yeah. So fucking Stabler agrees. He's so stupid. He fucking pulls out his flip phone and the guy's got the phone number written in crayon on the back of this paper. Bring, bring. Hey, this is Detective Elliot Stabler. I'm calling on behalf of Robert Rule. And Rule screams from behind him, I miss you so much! The other line goes dead. She hung up. Of and course. the dude was like, thanks for trying. Mm-mm-mm-mm. God, this was the dumbest shit I've ever seen. He should not have a job. No. The fucking, oh no. At I know there's like a fucking ticking time clock right now, but mm-hmm. like, you're fucking stupid. Right. At Our Lady of Light High School, Munch asks Andrea Mason how well she knew Debbie Cooper. She doesn't really remember much. Also, she doesn't seem to give a shit. I think it's really great you guys are, you know, but I just don't really... Yeah. Yeah. Her acting was like, it, oh, it was weird. She was the only one in the room who wasn't talking about a murdered girl. Yeah. But she's like... Mm much about debbie she was a bit of a late bloomer kind of awkward and nobody took any interest in her nobody liked her except for like vivian she wasn't really that likable she was actually my least favorite student and i'm glad she's dead i had my fingers crossed for a couple years and then and then she died it was perfect (laughs) i had nothing to do with it but i wasn't sad about it like we're not missing much you know what i mean i literally asked sansa (laughs) one year for christmas for christmas for her to die and she did she did (laughs) every year on my birthday i blow out a candle and go oh i wish debbie cooper was dead (laughs) (laughs) so she says that nobody really took an interest in debbie except for vivian parish but vivian parish boop boop moved to new mexico Mm. stabler is in wong's office at the fbi fucking office in new york wong's at his desk doesn't even look up and he says let me guess Rule gave you nothing. Stabler says that Rule only gave him the shit he's seen and heard on the newspapers already. Mm-hmm. Wong's still looking down writing and he's like, one day you're going to actually realize that I know what I'm doing. And Stabler's like, I had to give it a shot. And then Wong says, apology accepted. Let's move on. How, why do you guys accept this from Stabler? Like, why do you, like, whatever. Wong knows so. that if there's no point in doing laps with Stabes. Yeah. Wong wants to try and get Brodus's other cellmate, Leroy Russell, to talk. He's still refusing... Just then, a detective Yorkin and Yankovic from Brooklyn SVU walk in looking for Stabler. They're pissed because the call Stabler placed for rule was actually to one of his victims. Mm. So this woman like had his rules child after she was raped as a teenager. So Stabler was like, oh, she called Brooklyn SVU in hysterics. Mm -hmm. Obviously. And I was like, oh, my fucking God, Stabler. I loved the one detective who came in and she's like, care to tell us what the hell you were doing? I also love that Huang was in the room because he was just gently and professionally spanking Stabes. And then these people come in and just affirm that Huang was correct. He's not the Mm. kind of guy that would obnoxiously side eye but he would just like look down at the papers that he was writing on and you would see his eyebrows go up and he would just sort of go yeah. mm. obviously we're cutting to Craig's office 
Stabler is about to get chewed the fuck out. The victim's name is Elizabeth Shockman. She was fucking 16 when Rural raped her. Craig is like, what the fuck were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Stabler kind of tries to defend himself, but not too much. He's just like, fucking Rule told me a fabricated story about not being able to talk to his kid, and I fucking, I bought it. Rule got that number because he was, he was co-counsel in his own defense, and it was on the paperwork because Elizabeth was a witness at his trial. Mal, this is another thing. Is that a fucking thing? Because I understand that you can represent yourself, but then you get all of that information. That's fucking dangerous. Yeah, that's right? weird. Yeah. Bing! Mal. Craigan's like, I should fucking put you at a desk, which he fucking should. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and I should send you to apologize to Elizabeth. And Stabler's like, I already did that. Elizabeth feels violated again. As she fucking should. Mm -hmm. If he gets no fucking punishment for this, I'll kill myself. I will. (laughs) Right now, today. Stabler's beating himself up a little bit because he should. Mm. Craigan sees that. He sees a little bit of Stabler feeling bad. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to call Brooklyn SVU and see if I can smooth it over. And I was like, what the fuck? Right. Jeffries can't fuck once in a while? Mm -hmm. Like, what? You can't smooth that over, Craigan? She's too good for this precinct. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she fucking is. So in the squad room, Munch is calling around looking for this Vivian Parrish. And then, oh shit, we see Benson in the background. I was just like, yay. (laughs) Munch is on hold and he's like, do you want to tell me how my partner can't get his fucking recertification? Turns out he like shot his gun off too early and Toots is like polishing guns at his desk and he's like, F you guys. It was weird. It was just a little moment to explain where Benson and Toots were. Oh, was she getting her recertification too? Yeah, she was with him. That's why she was like, yeah, he just shot it off a little early or whatever. Yeah. Benson asked Stabler where he's at with all this and he's like, I don't have any other moves right now. Leroy Russell won't talk. This Leroy Russell guy point blank murdered a kid in a robbery. So he's the one that converted to Islam. He only appealed once and moved his execution day up. Toots says, this is the only thing that Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all have in common. A path. And I was like, um, actually they're all like spinoffs of each other and there's like, whatever, they all have the same guy. Whatever. Right. These um, these three religions are the Law and Order franchises. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Toots is like, you got to be a man of God by changing on the inside, blah, blah, blah. Benson thinks that Stabler should try and appeal to Leroy's religion. Toots tells Stabler to tell Leroy that he has a, quote, blood debt. Leroy took a life, so he owes a debt for spilling blood. Apparently, that's Islamic justice. I have no idea if that's actually in the Quran. And I mm-hmm. wasn't about to, like, Google it and be like, <laughs> I'm an expert. I know a thing. <laughs> right. You, know? and you never know if you're going to get the right information and shit anyway. But, yeah, it's something, that, it's something that Toots said. So it is SVU level Real. fact. Yeah. But as far as us genuinely knowing, we don't know. Stabler's at the Henderson apartment. He's talking to the father of the kid that Leroy shot and killed. This dad has a memorial wall for his kid with photos mm-hmm. and awards. And it stops Stabler in his tracks. Yeah. It's, you can tell this dad is reliving this all the time. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine. I can't fucking. I don't even want to. I can't even imagine. Stabler wants this dad to face Leroy and ask him to talk to Stabler and Huang because he might have information that would help another grieving family. And Henderson's like, no. Stabler, who's a walk on a tightrope. He's got those special shoes. Bloop, bloop. Arms out. Cute. <laughs> tightrope he's walking he says that Uh he believes henderson can face his son's killer because he opposed the death penalty for leroy stabler's like i think you're strong enough don't tell people what strength is to other people like fuck you right maybe strength to him is moving on from it without focusing on the killer or without engaging with him or what like maybe he has a different idea of it it's not it's not up to you yeah but i get it like stabler is throwing fucking hail mary's clock ticking trying to get help for this family. Right. So Stabler's like, well, I think you're strong enough. And Henderson's like, frankly, I don't give a shit what you think. Did he actually say I don't give a shit? I no. Oh, he just <laughs> said I don't care what you think. Yeah. yeah. He spoke against the death penalty for himself. Nothing to do with fucking Leroy. Leroy being put to death doesn't lessen his own pain or bring his son back. Mm-hmm. Stabler apologized for reopening this old wound. And Henderson said, you didn't. My wounds never heal. Damn. Oh, chills just now saying that. Mm -hmm. Stabler pulls out a picture of Debbie and says, at least you know who killed your child. Debbie Cooper's parents don't. Mm. Okay. You should have just said that in the beginning, Stabes. I know. Yeah. How exhausting for this guy to tell you no every way he can think of for you to be like, I'm going to checkmate you with sadness and responsibility and guilt. So why are you even trying? Yeah. So now we're in death row. Henderson, Stabler, and Huang are in a cell. 
as an officer brings Leroy in shackled and chained. Henderson says to Leroy, I'm told you're a religious man now. And Leroy says, he like won't look at him. And he's like, I owe you a debt. And Henderson says, you can't pay it. So I need you to talk to these men, answer their questions and try not to lie. Stabler tells Leroy he wants him to answer questions about Brodus because they shared a cell for three years. He didn't know Brodus that well, but his impressions of him were that he was a killer and that he used to always ask him questions about why Leroy was on death row and who he killed and how he did it. But the answers Leroy gave him always pissed off Brodus. And Wong says, that's because you killed a young man you didn't hunt first. So Brodus couldn't get a vicarious thrill from your experience. I am watching the dad be there for this fucking conversation Mm -hmm. yeah Leroy literally says I shot that kid in the face because he saw me but Brodus took pleasure from killing Mm -hmm. Leroy says that Brodus talked to him one night about all the shit that he had done like stalking gutting and doing shit to the bodies Leroy says quote he used to think he was smarter than everyone even when he made mistakes he killed a blind girl close to home and I was like oh my god Debbie was blinded by Brodus and that was close to home (gasps) remember Mm mm-hmm Stabler asks Leroy how Brodus did it, and he's like, I don't know, and I didn't ask. And then he wants to go back to his cell. Henderson says to Leroy, you refuse to speak during your sentencing. I need to know what my son's last moments were like. Did he say anything? And I was like, oh my god. And Leroy has his back to him, and he's like, no, sir, you don't need the image of your boy dying with my voice in your head telling you how. Yeah, and his voice is all rattly and regretful, Mm. and this guy's a really good actor. Cut to the courthouse. Stabler and Cabot are doing a walk and talk. He's telling her that Brodus himself admitted to blinding and killing a girl too close to home. Cabot's like, it means nothing. It's just hearsay testimony from a man on death row. And then, oh my God, Munch did get a hold of Vivian Parrish and she had dated Brodus for six months and he picked her up from school every now and then and gave Debbie Cooper a ride home once or twice. <gasps> Holy shit. But Cabot's like, I don't know what else to do because New Jersey isn't playing ball with this. And then he's like, well, just explain it to her parents. I was like, Jesus. Debbie's parents, the Coopers, walk up and tell Cabot they heard there's new evidence and ask where they should go from here. Cabot says she can't prove in court that Brodus killed their daughter, but they are like super sure he's guilty and he's going to be executed and so that they'll have justice. Mm -hmm. And then Mrs. Cooper asks her if she's familiar with Otis Toole. And I was like, oh my God. (gasps) I'm actually going to do this for the chaser. Good. I was hoping you when I when I heard that I was like she's gonna do tool. They don't know if the, if they can like live with the idea of not knowing who their daughter's killer is, and they need some hope, you know. And he's like, you need to do if there's anything that you can do, you need to do it. They reference a tool who died before they could find out if he actually killed John Walsh's son. So I'm gonna talk about all of that in the chaser. Stay tuned. Who's John Walsh? You should talk about how he used to hang out with fucking. Henry, the other serial killer. Henry Lee Lucas? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Cabot's like, oh, fuck. Mrs. Cooper says that after 21 years, you can still see the rage and grief in John Walsh from his son being killed. Mm-hmm. Mr. Cooper says his hope died along with his son's killer. If you don't do everything within your power to prove Brodus murdered our daughter, so will ours. And Cabot's like, oh, with responsibility. And for her to be like, well, you'll get justice either way. We're pretty certain. It's pretty Mm -hmm. intense wishful thinking to assume they'd take anything less than 100% certainty that they knew their daughter's killer. Mm -hmm. She was just kind of like... It's probably most likely this guy. So we good? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so Cabot's sitting in an office with Brodus's lead counsel, Wade Harris. They casted the best person to look like a douchey fucking New York lawyer. This guy was in SVU season two, episode 20, peak as ADA Malcolm Sanderson. And he's actually been in a ton of procedurals and soap operas. He looks mm. like a procedural slash soap opera guy. Mm. So this dude, this dude, this actor fucking wade harris lead counsel for brodus was most recently that i've seen him in the movie palm springs did you see that movie i don't think so it was andy samberg and christine miliati it was like where it was like groundhog's day kind of oh i heard about it but i haven't seen it is it good or simmons was in it fucking skoda yeah yeah it was good I i watched it it was it was funny and like weird it was like indie weird funny hmm. dark ish yeah a lot of suicide humor <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> this dude just kind of like plops down on a chair and puts his feet up on a table he says i'm surprised new york wants to stay the execution and she's like <laughs> We're not interested in stopping the execution. She says she wants to put Brodus on trial for murder and that he needs to keep Brodus alive and this will benefit them because then they'll get like six months to a year of time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, 
I think I could drag it to 18 months if I drown you in paperwork. Cabot said she requested a temporary restraining order, I- I'm guessing, at New Jersey. She's pretty sure the judge will be into it with the new evidence and hearing from Debbie Cooper's parents. And he's like, well, I want to see the evidence. You have to show me. She says she won't show him the evidence only when and if she files. She tells Wade he has to keep Brodus alive, and right now she's all he's got. Like, that's his she- job as his defense yeah. attorney. She's so good. She's so good. And he agrees to her deal. He has, got like, three big rings on, too, and I was like, this guy's a douche. <laughs> <laughs> in New Jersey Superior Court, it's one day before the execution, by the way. Cabot is asking the judge and her bangs for a temporary mm-hmm. restraining mm-hmm. order because mm-hmm. they have new evidence that links Brodus to Debbie's open murder case. Ex boyfriend, New Jersey ADA, is there fighting against it. He doesn't think their evidence even meets the criteria for a trial, and he's very smug and smarmy about it, and I mm-hmm. hate him right now. Cabot's not trying to convict Brodus, but she doesn't want the truth to die with him either. Either. ADA ex-boyfriend says this is all a ploy to stop the execution. And Cabot's like, I don't care if he dies, guy. You can execute him whenever you fucking want. I just want to get the truth for this family. He's going to be just as dead six months from now. So it doesn't fucking matter. I have no fucking dog in this fight. Mm-hmm. The judge isn't so sure that they're going to even be able to get anything from Brodus, but tells everyone to chill the fuck out and hang out around the area while she goes and thinks. She's going to go hang in her chambers and Everybody else is going to go get a hot dog. It's whatever. Yeah. She's going to like smoke a spliff, open up her fucking robe and be like, (sighs) (laughs) unbutton her jeans. (laughs) Cabot and Stabler are now at some restaurant, obviously nearby. I think it's like a seafood place or something. There was like weird paintings on the wall. Cabot can't gauge what their chances are right now. She feels weird helping a serial killer not die when he really fucking deserves it. All of a sudden, ADA ex-boyfriend comes to their table orders a wedge salad and asks if this whole thing is really just for an interview. I don't think he believes Cabot, what her real intentions are. Yeah. Cabot says that an interview is all they've ever asked for and nothing has changed. He says that he needs her word that they will decline to prosecute no matter what Brodus tells her. And of course she agrees. He says he'll set up the interview. They need to be ready in an hour. And Stabler is pumped. He's nodding super hard looking at Cabot like, hell yeah, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Rubs and he's his like fucking handlebars. <laughs> They're at a fancy dinner. <laughs> rum, rum, yeah. <laughs> then he's like, God, have, have you tried this wedge salad? It's so good. And she's oh like, my ah! God. <laughs> Your ex boyfriend told me. All right, now Wong and Sable are in the cell before Brodus comes in. It's now four hours before execution. Wong's totally prepping Sabler and he's telling him to be Brodus's pal when Wong stresses him out too much otherwise stabler needs to push him hard stabler is listening to wong now trusting that wong knows what he's doing and listening to how they can work together to analyze brodus and get answers because wong is going to protect him he's gonna look he's gonna watch his body language he's gonna they can work together wong tells him to pay attention to brodus's eyes serial killers have a focused stare like they're hunting an animal like they're a hunting animal like they're an animal who is hunting yeah yeah, Huang thinks that this might not work and Brodus may play games this whole time until the end. And Stabler needs to be prepared if they run out of time. It's like, this mm-hmm. might work, this might not work. Either way, you gotta be chill and prepared. Yeah. Just then, the guards bring in fucking Brodus. Stabler shakes Brodus's hand, but Huang doesn't, which I loved. Mm-hmm. Brodus is Huang like, oh. like this. <laughs> <laughs> Brodus tells Huang his job is boring and that he didn't invite them there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to sum up that whole thing. But he's not surprised that they're there because feds are in and out all the fucking time. Brodus says he's been helping the feds out, but they want him to admit to stuff he hasn't done. And he's like, it's so funny. (laughs) Cops trying to beat their own clocks. (laughs) He doesn't sound like that. He sounds way cooler. Not cooler. He sounds scarier. Yeah, he's scary. He's scary. Oh, he's so scary. I know. (laughs) Stabler asked Brodus what's so great. I just shook my shirt off. He's so scary. (laughs) Stabler, he like literally gutted people. And I'm like... I get it. His character did. At the craft service table, I'm shoving all those fucking bagels off and we are <laughs> humping right there. <laughs> I'm, we're going to pork on the craft service table. Get in my trailer. What's his name? You don't get a trailer. <laughs> well, that's what he says to me because I oh, walk on set and he's like, <gasps> <laughs> breathtaking. I walk on set in 2002. Oh, no, I was legal. Okay, keep going. <laughs> 
Stapler asked Brodus what's so great about Our Lady of Light and like why he wanted to send his daughter there. Mm-hmm. Remember in the beginning in the press release, that's why the Coopers thought that Brodus killed their daughter because he mentioned her school. Right. Stapler says, you don't have any kids. And Brodus is like, well, maybe I do. I mean, what woman would come forward saying she has a kid with me, much less have slept with me? I would. Yeah. He won't give a name and tell Stapler he's going to have to wait till his will goes in probate. And then Stabler asks him why he didn't kill his girlfriend, Vivian Parrish. Is it because if he killed her, he would have gotten caught right away? If he had gotten caught right away, 13 women would still be alive. And Brodus says, the record says 12. And Stabler says, we both know the record is incorrect. Brodus seems irritated. And then Wong says, have they given you anything for the insomnia? And he's like, the pills don't work. And then Wong passes a file to Stabler. And Brodus like kind of perks up and he's like, what's what's in there? And Wong says, oh, it's a project. And we want to know your opinion um, of a killer's MO. No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> they want to go through the 3Ds of sadism with him. Dread, dependency, and de- degradation. And Brodus is like, oh, um, can I see that file? Mm. And he, he like really wants to look at it. Ew. Props to get a like a creepy murder boner from like yes, photos Yes, 100%. And stuff. Yeah. Stabler slides him the photos. It was so dramatic in the, the way he slid them to him. Mm-hmm. I loved it so hard. He like slid it across the table. The dude slaps his hand on it and it echoes like the slap echoes. And it was just a one second little clip. I am on the edge of my fucking scrot. I loved it. <laughs> My scrote is positively vibrating right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> I I have taken my scrote, nailed it into each end of the room, and I'm <laughs> snuggled up in my little scrote hammock, excited for the next moment. What's going to happen? Okay, so dude opens the file. He's fucking pissed. He's, there's no crime scene photos. See, it's like, there's one under the Emmy report, and it's a fucking high school photo of Debbie Cooper. Sailor says that the ME said that the perp tortured Debbie. He asks him if he has any idea why the perp would do that. Brodus fucking crumples up Debbie's pictures and throws it behind his shoulder. And he says, and now, and slides the file back. Huang asks him why he doesn't know, because he did a lot of the same things to his victims. The big girls that he chose, you might have some insight into why Debbie was cut so deeply. Brodus once again asks for crime scene photos. Stabler's like, you don't need them. Look inside your head. You'll see it. And Brodus says, see someone else's work? It can't be done. Can I stop you for a second? Yes. Why did Why all you of answer a sudden, for me? <laughs> in the in the eleventh hour of this episode, they're like, "By the way, these girls were not cute and bigger." I know. Like I what? Know. Why is this coming up? Why is this even part of the conversation? It has nothing to do with anything. And I hate that he's like, "Well, the big girls that he chose." I'm sorry. I'm also looking at this photo of a normal-sized fucking girl. In high school who's like fucking 15. I was so... I was like... I know. I know. It's neither here nor there. It has nothing to do with any, like, psychological aspect of it at all. Like, I don't... I don't get it. Mm. They're like, he did all these terrible, awful things and gutted people and bodies. And the women were kind of chubby. Gross. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) Stabler starts saying that the perp probably overpowered her. Easy for a man of his size, like Mm -hmm. Brodus's. He bound her tight with tape, plays with her for a while, feeds off her terror. She dreads when he leaves and dreads when he returns. He wants a few days with her. Now she has to depend on him. And Brodus is so into this. I know. Brodus pipes in and he says, but then he has to take the thing and slice it open and see what's going on in there. The knife goes in like butter. So warm. Ew. Uh, so I can't warm even. inside, but he has to be quick about it. It'll be cold soon. And then Stabler asks, why do you have to be quick about it? And Brodus says, to be born again. Stabler looks over at Wong and says, are, are we talking about religion now? And Wong says, no, where's the one place your mother can never leave you? And then Brodus goes, oh, psychiatric pap. You always blame the mom. When he screamed, you always blame the mom. His voice got real hot and raspy. And I was like, this Mm. sucks for me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But they do. I mean, he's not wrong. They do. Yeah. The stable's like, well, look at your mom. And Brodus gets mad. And he's like, leave her out of this. And this is when the synthy violins start. Oh, God. Yeah. (laughs) Stablish says... She couldn't stand you. She left you with, with your grandparents. When they died, she shipped you off to foster care. And Brodus is like, she came and got me. She loved me. And Sailor says, Matt, 
No, you tell the truth. She got married, had a daughter with her new husband, and when she left him, she took your half-sister with her and left you behind again. I mean, obviously she loathed you. She saw the real you and it made her want to vomit. How many times did she tell you she wished you'd been aborted? Brodus yells, she never said that. She loved me. She never said that ever. I'm done talking to you. And then Wong shoots this like cute little side eye at Stabler like, ooh, girl, you're doing so good. (laughs) (laughs) You know? And Stabler's like, we're not finished. (laughs) You're helping us with this one case. We've covered dread and dependency. Now we're going to see how Debbie Cooper was degraded. How many times was the killer with her post-mortem, huh? Just think like the killer. Go ahead. And Brutus is like, that's obscene. How should I know? Ask the shrink. He probably treated cycles like that. And then Wong says, well, it depends on how often the killer visited the body. And Stabler asks Brutus how many times he checked on his victims. He's like, I only went back to see if they were still where I had left them. And then Stabler's like, not this guy. He went back to be with them, you know, and like winks at him, which was really weird. And it's funny because Brutus is acting so disgusted over someone having sex with a corpse. And the irony is not lost on us with yeah. how sick this guy is. Burr says, I can't help you. Stabler laughs and he's like, do you believe I'm going to think any less of you? And then Brodus yells, I'm telling you, I never messed around with them after they were dead. The guy you're looking for is sick, real sick. And then Stabler turned some weird fucking corner and he was like, well, what woman alive would be with you though? Brodus is like, Vivian Parrish. And Stabler is like, I talked to her and she said you had a tough time closing the deal, if you know what I mean. And then Brodus says, well, if she did, then that bitch lied. You're a cop. You're supposed to be able to tell the difference. My dick works. Yeah. And Stabler leans in and says, oh, I can and I do. And then Brodus <laughs> continues and he's like, it's in their nature. You know, they say they don't want it, but they really do. No means yes. Yes means no. You know, I should have disappeared that whore before she went out west. I missed my chance by 20 minutes. I want to know that whole story. I know. I, I thought know. it was supposed to be something I understood. I'm like, 20 yeah. minutes. Stabler says, but she knew what you were. And she was way ahead of you. And then Brota says she was an idiot, a moon-eyed cow. Debbie just wanted someone to tell her her ugly ass that she was pretty, that she was in a Harlequin romance, stupid bitch. And then Sailor says, Debbie? We're like, oh, he said Debbie instead of Vivian. Brota says, slip of the tongue. One of my Jersey girls. And Sailor says, no, it's not. None of them are fucking named Debbie or Deborah. Not even their middle names. Stop lying. All of a sudden, he's like the munch Rolodex of remembering shit. Yeah. He's like, why don't you stop lying? Let's just get down to it. Brota is like, you're not as smart as you think you are and puts his head down on the table and then asks for the time. Now we're exactly right at the beginning. Full circle. This is the very opening scene. (gasps) Yeah. On death row, Cabot asks ADA ex-boyfriend how many executions he's done. He says Brodus will be his second. If his presence wasn't required, he wouldn't even be here. And she's like, "Mm, you can ask for the death penalty, but you can't stomach the reality, huh? He says he does his job and he does it for the families. All of a sudden, this emergency red light starts flashing. This is from the beginning where Brodus attacks Mm -hmm. Huang and Stabler, so we know what's happening in that room. Guards get (laughs) Cabot and what? (laughs) This was so, the way they shuffled them into the room with the family. He he like ran out of them like he was going to give them a big bear hug and he like (laughs) pushes them and they're running backwards. Like like there are a couple of like goats that got out of a fucking pen, you know? (laughs) It was hilarious. So they're like walking down this hallway, you know, they're they're walking, talking. There's these double doors open this alarm starts going off and this guard pops out of nowhere and awkwardly shuffles them into this room which is like the viewing room for the execution or whatever because it's full Mm -hmm. of family members that are there for brutus's execution i always want to say brutus et tu brute that's a hot name brutus and then these guards shut the doors on him. It's like, lock it down. The families are all worried that this is going to stop the execution. But everybody is spinning. Nobody knows what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Back in the cell. We're back at the scene. Brodus is slamming Huang's head against the wall. He's lightly tapping Huang's head against the wall. <laughs> He's choking him. And he's like... <laughs> Uh, dramatically and then he bounces off of a bed that wasn't there before and it's there now (laughs) boing boing all over the place stabler jumps on this dude's back and huang slides down the wall unconscious and there's a blood smear because it was so aggressive Mm -hmm. stabler and brodus are rolling around on the floor fighting it's so fucking hot stabler's Mm -hmm. getting his ass beat i know (sighs) and then brodus has him on the ground he's choking him and brodus goes debbie didn't fight back oh stabler (sighs) punches him in the side of the head sort of guards rush in sort of the punch was like it didn't go anywhere near his head it was like it was a terrible (laughs) yeah this whole scene it was like a double fake punch that didn't that was like 10 inches away from the side of his head then guards rush in and just start beating brutus's ass 
with billy clubs pull stabler off and you see brodus's face and he's like laughing and yeah and then stabler realizes what's going on and blurts out don't this is what he wants Ah!" (laughs) and all of a sudden this cop fucking slow motion bops him in the forehead with the butt end of this billy club knocks him he out. was like oh <laughs> okay stabler's in the execution waiting room with cabot and ad ex-boyfriend cabot tells him that wong is okay but they want to keep him overnight brodus is on a fucking ventilator stabler's like i want to be the one to tell the families about this they need to know brodus planned the whole thing and ada ex-boyfriend is like fuck off you've done enough all they care about is that we can't execute him now cabot says that the state can't execute an unhappy healthy man it's law as long as he's in a coma they can't get justice stabler says it's not a waste because he got a confession from brodus on debbie cooper ada ex-boyfriend says they won't care would you go home outside of the prison thingy a crowd has formed for this execution like anti-death penalty people stabler gets let out of the gates and sees the cutie little coopers and they're waiting and he goes up to talk to them and that's it Mm. it's the end it was a good fucking episode it was so good do you want to do the chaser Mm -hmm. okay let's just get into it July 27th, 1981. It was a Monday afternoon and Reve Walsh was taking her six-year-old son Adam to the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida. Wait, are you not doing the whole thing? I'll get into that. This is about Adam Walsh. The focus of this is Adam Walsh, the victim. So in standard shopping with your mom in the 20th century, Reve Mm. let Adam hang at a kiosk where several other little boys were taking turns playing the Atari video games that were on display. Right. Do you remember doing that when we were kids? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was also like arcades in malls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We used to do this all the time at Best Buy in the 90s when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So there would be a Nintendo display or something, some video game thing. And, you know, mom would be like, okay, don't leave this spot i'm gonna go do something for five fucking minutes and then i'm gonna be back so reve left her son to go ask about a lamp on sale and when she returned to the kiosk adam and all of the other boys were gone the store manager told reve that the boys had been fighting over whose turn it was and were subsequently kicked out unfortunately the employees didn't realize that adam wasn't with the older boys Mm. those boys had all been in the store without their parents so they had them all leave the store and i can only imagine adam's six years old and an adult Mm. tells him like hey you guys got to get out of here and instead of okay yeah instead of speaking up and going well i have to find my mom you know he's just like okay whatever this adult told me i have to leave oh i just i can't with this whole story but Mm -hmm. reve searched the store had him paged over the intercom everything that you would do not panicking at that point after an hour and a half Mm -hmm. of searching and paging she ran into her mother-in-law randomly at one point and she was helping to look reve called the hollywood police department a long and tiresome search for adam began to find nothing Mm -hmm. again this was on july 27th 1981 on the morning of august 11th two weeks after adam had vanished john and reve john walsh is the dad we all know who john walsh is and we'll get there We do, and we'll get there. John and Reve pled for the safe return of their son, offering up a $100,000 reward. Today's money, $285,000, just Mm -hmm. for curiosity's sake. Because we do that, yeah. Little did they know Adam's remains were being identified at that very moment. No. The day before, two fishermen had found a severed head in a drainage canal near Vero Beach, later to be identified as six-year-old Adams. So Mm -hmm. this location is like 120 miles from where Adam was taken. The case was worked and unsolved for three years. Then, fucking Otis Tool. Is is that how you... It's not Otis, it's Otis? It's not Otis. It gets mispronounced a lot and misspelled a lot but it's o-t-t-i-s and there's older footage older news stuff that pronounces it otis but anything more recent not even just more recent but there's there's more stuff that says that that is a mispronunciation so i'm gonna say otis i'm actually just gonna say tool because because it's appropriate it's appropriate it's his last name and he's a fucking tool Mm-hmm. Otis Elwood Toole was born March 5th, 1947, OMG John's birthday. My husband's birthday is March 5th. It's Look at mine. you have zero care. reaction. You have zero reaction when it's, <laughs> it's <something>. not mine. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm doing this research and I'm like, oh, March 5th. Oh my God, that's John's birthday. She didn't even take a sharp breath. Nothing. She didn't blink. <laughs> <gasps> it's two months before my birthday. <laughs> 
two months, so, two months and two days. This guy was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. So right off the bat, we know that he's trash. To our Florida listeners, JK. To everyone else, not JK. <laughs> His dad. Enjoy your bath salts, idiots. <laughs> just kidding. Just sorry. Kidding. You know what? We have assumptions made about us being in Wisconsin. You guys know. You understand the Florida jokes. Please don't take it personally. Yeah. Like there are some of you that aren't garbage. Just like there are some of us that aren't fucking Republican. His dad, an alcoholic, left the family when Tool was very young. He was left to be raised by his abusive mother. Is Wisconsin known for being Republican? Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Madison is a blue bubble. Like, Dane County is a blue bubble in this state. Go to fucking Janesville, dude. Huh, gross. Yeah. You don't leave your house, let alone Madison, very often. So, and when you do, you go to like Chicago or Milwaukee or something. You know, you don't go to. How long has it been since you've been to Shell Lake? Jesus. That shit is red. Shell Lake, cute. Okay. Also V racist, but yeah, cute. Um, go to fucking Baraboo. <laughs> I'm going to be done right. trashing places. No, I'm not. The whole state. We're garbage. Throw us in the trash. I'm not getting a response from you, so I just keep going with it. Yeah, keep going. Um, okay. Tool claimed that his mother would dress him up in girls' clothes and call him Susan. Also that he was sexually molested and assaulted by multiple family members and family friends growing up. When he was five, he had said that he was raped by a friend of his father's. He came out to his family as gay when he was 10. And so obviously because of that, the abuse got worse, especially from his grandmother who called him him, quote, the devil's child. He said that his grandma was a Satanist who showed him many rituals that included grave robbing and self-mutilation. So I keep saying allegedly and apparently not to doubt a survivor of abuse, but because this guy is very famous for lying, uh, for claiming murders that aren't his and for telling fantastical stories that are proven false, like regarding his murders. But the Satanist thing, I just... I feel like that paints a negative portrait of people who do practice Satanism. Mm -hmm. so, well, and also when he was telling this, he was he was probably in jail in the 80s mm -hmm. and it was right in, in the middle of the Satanic panic. Yes. Yeah. And the only thing that made me go bloop, I want to say something about this is because I think Satanists get a bad rap from oh, for sure. people who don't give a moment to understand. So I saw this thing. It was a tweet conversation or something that turned into a meme, I don't know, where someone said, people don't understand the basics of Satanism. Satanists don't even believe in Satan. To which mm -hmm. someone replied, well, then who does? And the OP was like, I believe they're called Christians. Christians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, that is a sweet and accurate kind of burn mm -hmm. but anyway tbd on this dude's truth but again i am not saying that to doubt his abuse because i guarantee this guy had a, a rough rough childhood regardless of what the actual details of it were okay mm -hmm. okay so uh, another another aside not quite an aside but we were talking about this the other day before we were going to record this about what the chaser was going to be and mm -hmm. we talked about the many, many branches from this one story. And Gabe was like, I want to hear everything. And I was like, that's yeah. going to be an entire fucking episode. So right. mainly for time and continuity, I decided to keep this chaser's focus on Adam Walsh and his particular murder and that case. And I'll go much deeper deeper into Otis Tool's other crimes and his relationship with Henry Lee Lucas and go into his mm -hmm. shit, Lucas's shit, yeah. a bit too in a bonus episode for Patreon. We'll do like a bonus chaser. Yeah. It's like we talk about a serial killer and it's like this guy killed 15 people. Each one of those people has their own story. It just so happens mm -hmm. that Adam Walsh's story is one that we have a lot of details on because it was a very famous murder because of what his dad went on mm -hmm. to do and everything. So we're going to get back to that. So we're going to find out more about Otis Tool in a Patreon bonus chaser. Oh my God. I'm so excited to hear you tell it to me too. Because okay. <laughs> I, I know a little bit about all of it, mm -hmm. but I don't know the whole like Everything. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. That said, let's go to October 21st, 1983, 171 days after Gabe's birthday. <laughs> um, did you do the math on that? I real? really did. Yes, I did. I yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> October 21st, 1983, we're 171 days after Gabe's birthday. Tool was imprisoned for two other unrelated murders when he confessed to killing Adam Walsh. He told police that he had picked Adam up in the Sears parking lot with promises of toys and candy. He said that his intention was to take Adam back home to Jacksonville to be his adoptive son. After quite mm -hmm. a bit of driving, Adam got scared and began to cry, telling Tool that he wanted to go home. He then, th there's some detail here, so, you know, 
warning. Tool said he punched him in the face to quiet him, and when that didn't work, Tool beat Adam until he was unconscious. Tool drove to a rural area then and decapitated Adam with a machete. He claims that he then took Adam's body home, incinerated it, forgetting about his head, and then days later, when Tool rediscovered the head in his car, he threw it into that canal. So the cops were like, Yay, OMG, you guys, we have his car and carpet from the back seat with blood stains. We can match the blood types and hopefully get some physical evidence to charge him. High fives all around. But then they soon found out that they had lost all of that evidence, a whole ass car, everything from inside it. What? Yeah. And Tool would go on then to recant his confession. And he went back and forth a couple of times on that confessing and recanting. How do you lose a whole car? I don't know. I mean, a lot. Like, did they accidentally, like, destroy it? Or did it just went missing? It was just gone. Nothing I read said anything about, like, or speculated on how it could have been lost. Everybody was just like, what the fuck? Where's the car? We don't know. Where's the bloodstained carpet that we cut out of this car that we found? Mm. So, I mean, some really, like, if that was still, they would have been able to pull Adam's DNA after a number of years. Not at that Mm, time, but eventually. But they don't have it. Yeah. Okay, again, we're going to talk more about this in the bonus uh, because his partner in crime slash BFF slash significant other was Henry Lee Lucas, and he was known as the confession killer. Tool was right up there. Oh, they like date. They they were kind of together. They were together. They were were together, together. Yes. Okay. Well, the movie's way off then. What a surprise. Anyway, Henry Lee Lucas was known as the confession killer, and Tool was right up there with trying to get weird ass serial killer clout in numbers. They were proven lying multiple times about different murders that they both claimed, which is mm. such a mind fuck for families looking for closure. Okay. Right. So he And what a what a what a fucking weird quote like goal to have. I know. What is that narcissism thing about It's a narcissistic trait to try to get attention no matter how you get it. So it's like, you know, what's going to get me attention is claiming all this shit and people are going to come talk to me and interview me and want to pick my brain Mm. and blah, blah, blah. And it's sick and we don't understand it, thankfully. So he made it very difficult to believe that he was telling the truth. The NBC TV movie Adam about the well-known murderer had come out and been on TV not long before he confessed. Between the lost evidence and the recant, they couldn't move forward on prosecuting Tool for Adam's death. But Tool would be spending life in prison anyway for these two other murders. John and Revae Walsh went on to launch the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Adam's death is also what drove John to create and host the hugely popular show America's Most Wanted in 1988. Do you know that the show Mm -hmm. aided in the arrest of over 1,000 fugitives? I know it did a lot of... um, Huge. Did a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. I mean, and that's all based on a grief-driven John Walsh. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take away from what Reve was doing either, because she also, she was huge in the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Can you imagine the fucking constant sort of like, this is my fault feeling? I think about the the person at Sears who kicked the kids out, the guilt that they probably had too. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that that's, I I don't know what the statistics are on this, but like marriages that last through a child's death it's very 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 difficult and did they stay together at the end of getting yeah. divorced or yeah no? they're they still did. married they're still married yeah they are they got married in 1971 i believe why do i remember that and they're still together they had three mm. kids after adam's death because he was their first and only child at the time and then they went on to have three kids and we're very vocal about there's nothing that can replace it obviously everybody knows that but what did they say about their daughter their daughter was born like a year after adam went missing it was everything was very public because adam's murder was very public but they said you know she's not a replacement for adam in fact quite the opposite because adam always wanted a little sister yeah oh it was just something that like hurt my heart so Years later, Tool's niece told John Walsh, Adam's dad, that her uncle had confessed one last time to Adam's murder as he lay dying of cirrhosis. Between that confession and a few other factors, the family was decidedly satisfied that they knew who killed Adam. They really, truly to this day believe that Tool killed him. On September 15th, 1996, 49-year-old Otis Tool died at the Florida State Prison of cirrhosis. Not AIDS. No. Why? Because that's what stapler said in the episode that he died of aids Mm -hmm. i forgot that from the episode i'm gonna have to look into that because everything that i read said that he died of cirrhosis 
But I, I mean, wonder. Jer- Jeremy could have been writing that day. So. Maybe. Or maybe maybe he did have AIDS. And the, I just never read anything that said he had AIDS. But, mm. okay, so these are some things that came out of it. By the late 90s, several retailers around the country were using Code Atom, which is a child safety precaution. When a kid is missing in a store, a Code Atom is announced. All of the doors are locked and an employee is posted at each exit until the child is found. And I mm. hope they still use that, but I've never heard of it. I never have either. I was thinking about asking John because John worked at Old Navy when he was in his early 20s or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if he would know that. I don't know. In the end, the case of Adam Walsh was officially closed on December 16th, 2008. The family was satisfied again, like I had said. It's hard just because of the lie. It's like, I don't know. I know. Why do they always got to lose shit? It's a whole entire car. Think about how many crimes there are and how much, I'm not excusing it, but think about how many crimes there are and how much evidence there is for each one of those, Mm -hmm. you know, and then years compiled. I don't know. I'm not excusing it, but it's like it's got to be. Well, really if it's hard. not if it's not working, fucking fix it then, because it's important. Yes. Oh no, <laughs> there's nothing I mean? more important. Yeah. Oh, well, that was good. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next week we have season three, episode sixteen, popular. Popular. When Stabler. I wanna be popular. What's that song where? <laughs> popular. <laughs> the nineties. Um, uh, no wait not yeah. that some popular see that's not the song that comes to my head I am I wanna be a popular from, from what's Kristen her face Kristen Chenoweth's part yeah. in that song popular her little I love her what is she uh, like 411 she's just this little poly pocket of a woman I know so season 3 episode 16 popular when Stabler hears from a family friend about a teenage girl who was raped but refuses to report it to the police he begins a covert investigation and the case progresses to uncover a web of sexual activity among teenagers after this episode um, execution and him being a tightrope I could not believe that the next one was him doing a bunch of bullshit again yeah i am not gonna do next week's episode i am just gonna write fan fiction of the cast of svu doing wicked munch's alphaba <laughs> <laughs> okay follow us on all social media at svu pod check out our patreon we got a bunch of stuff chasers friendship boats the january episode is us accidentally getting drunk <laughs> We had a super fun Christmas party. Different tiers, different stuff. More stuff, the higher tier. Boop, 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 boop. Email us at svupod at gmail.com. We've got merch and we're coming out with more. Yeah. Join our Facebook group, SVU Pod Elite Squad. Gabe will love you. I love that group. She loves the group. <laughs> she loves the group. She likes participating. I'm like, I just love I so <laughs> I'll text her something and she'll be like, post that in the group. <laughs> I actually have something I need to post in there. Okay. Yeah, that's it. See you soon. Love you. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an official sign off. We have merch. Get a tote. Love you. Bye. Okay. Totes get a tote. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I'm trying to pare this down so it's an appropriate length. An appropriate length. That was my nickname in high school. Uh, That was... (laughs) (laughs) What's in jizz? Men things like testosterone. I don't fucking know. Men things. (laughs) I'm not a biologist. I have to feed my family. I'm a dad. (laughs) I provide the relish. Sorry, I don't know how to get it all out. I keep interrupting. I just, I want to touch this guy's dick. I want to touch it. (laughs) I know none of this matters, but I like it. I do do. And to our elite squad patrons. Haley K, Sonia W, Jenny S, Sky K, Nikki B, Marissa M, Elki H, Sarah A, Annie G, Mary D, Andrew, Rebecca D, Miranda B, Shelby W, Lex, Emily T, Kayla W, Mallory G, Eliza W, Bonita R, Marin, Vanessa, Amy P, Jess M, Sonia Summer M, Melanie G, Courtney W, Ursula S, Emily A, Katrina C, Kate H, Uyanga, and Nicole R. Pew! We love you and, and appreciate, appreciate you. you.